very happy to be here. So much of what I want to talk about is actually a bit more lecture. And many of you work in cyanobacteria, obviously, given the seminar series, and in particular also cyanobacterial biotechnology. And there is still a bottleneck regarding the productivity. So low productivity, low titers are a major bottleneck for cyanobacterial biotechnology. And I have basically three themes I want to address today in regard to this topic. And the first theme is maximal growth rates versus productivity. As you know, there's now increasing interest in fast-growing strains. So people look for different strains than the common lab strains, strains that grow fast. And this was triggered not least here in 2015 with the rediscovery of this strain by the Pacasi Labs, Synococcus elongatus uh, 2973 which grows a lot faster than its close cousin, the 7942 strain with division times less than two hours. So meanwhile, there have been a few more studies of different strains. So we now have quite a couple of strains that grow faster than the common lab strains, all in the range of two hours division time, even a bit faster. And if you go into the literature, you now sometimes find statements like this. So I won't say from which paper, but it's a recent paper. And it stands representative for many of the approaches or the grants where people want to look at these fast growing strains. So the production rates in proof of concept studies, meaning cyanobacterial production of something, are below industrially relevant targets. So the recent discovery of a fast-growing cyanobacterium, the Synecococcus elongatus, is uh, 2973, has provided us with an opportunity to overcome productivity barriers. So there are several words here which are underlined, production rate, fast growing productivity. So the big question is, so how is this related to does fast grow overcome productivity barriers? And how are fast growth related to other properties of cyanobacteria? That's the crucial question. And at the very basic level, of course, the answer is no. So a high growth rate in itself does not overcome any productivity barrier. And the way you can think about it is like if you want a new car and you want something really efficient and productive and you think about it and you go to a dealer and start screening for the fastest one and you come up with this one, it's the fastest he had. And this might overcome productivity barriers depending on your definition of productivity. But usually fast growth is not associated with high efficiency and high productivity. There's even a negative correlation that usually things that are very fast, whether it's planes, cars, are less efficient than systems that are slower. On a different level, of course, there is something to be said for fast growth, because obviously they do something which allows them to grow fast. So they must handle the light in a different way, and we would like to know what. So the aim of this lecture here today is really to try to disentangle how is growth rate related to productivity. And like I said, many of the things I will tell are not super new in the sense that I discovered them. It's basically standard knowledge from chemical engineering. It's just repackaged a bit to fit a bit more the, the algal field and not so much generic heterotrophic organisms. Second theme is design of photobioreactors. So all of you work on algae or cyanobacteria. And one of the good things about cyanobacteria is that they grow in photobioreactors. So if you Google photobioreactor here, you will get pictures like this or pictures like this one, or I like in particular pictures like this one. These are just basically randomly drawn from the internet and they look fantastic. I mean, these are pieces of art. You can imagine that this thing can be built on Mars and is simply a, like a design icon in itself. So there's a company here in Berlin that wants to sell bioreactors, photobioreactors for urban farming. And I can imagine you sit in a restaurant, you have something like this, maybe a bit smaller in the middle of the room, illuminated with LEDs, maybe different color, different algae of different color. And you have your algae pasta and can eat it. So this is all fantastic. And they look, I mean, I would put the smaller ones in my room for decoration. The question is, are they efficient for actual biomass production? That's something to discuss. I have my doubts. So the second theme is to suggest different ways to actually produce biomass so beyond the aesthetic value of these reactors. So what are good ways to produce biomass? The third theme is for modeling. It's always nice if you do models to actually have unexpected results from models. And I hope I can show examples where a mathematical model can indeed provide insight that at least to me was new and I didn't expect from the outset. So in, on the contrary, I, I expected the opposite to happen. And uh, it turned out that this was not the case. And this is in particular related to antenna truncation. So this at the very end, I hope to share this with you.
So we can get right to it. There will be some mathematics and equations, but I hope I keep it to the level that is essential to understand the concepts. As most of you know, my main job is modeling. So we look at large scale models in particular. This is an example of a genome scale network of synecocystis, where you have like a detailed representation of all the metabolic reactions. You can look at which products are produced, which are the enzymatic conversion steps that lead there. Today, I will not be looking at these kind of models at all. I want to look at the simplest possible model to describe growth. And this is this one. So from Jacques Monod, um, already this is uh, 70 years ago, proposed that to describe the growth of bacterial cultures, we can use this kind of hyperbolic dependence or hyperbolic function here, which is now called the Monod equation. He didn't call it like this. And that describes the growth of the culture in response to a limiting nutrient. In his case, Salmonella or E. coli, I'm not sure, and glucosin. It's E. coli here. This is still also the dominant way to describe cyanobacteria or a particular algae culture. So the Monod equation, I've written it here already for a light as a limiting nutrient. So I will be the light intensity. You have the growth rate of the culture and depends on the limiting light intensity here with this kind of hyperbolic function. So it has this kind of shape. And the vast majority, so I have a big pile here on models of photobioreactors, the, the vast majority uses this kind of hyperbolic functions to describe the growth of the algae in some uh, light limited setting. Unfortunately, it's not the best description. So I wrote here, it's not a good, it is a good description, but it's for our purpose, not the best one because we want to look at high productivity. And if you want high productivity at some point, we have to use high light. You won't get high productive cultures with candlelight. So you must use a bit of light intensity. And if you use a bit of light intensity, you will encounter photo inhibition. So this is a typical growth curve. This is a synecocystis 6803. And I will tell a bit more about the data, but but it usually has this kind of hyperbolic dependence, but then at high light intensity, growth rate decreases again due to photo inhibition. And if you want to explore the range where you have productive cultures, we also have to look at light intensities, which are in this range and beyond. So we have to take into account this photo inhibition. Therefore, we will use a different function. We will use the Haldane-Iber model. This is very similar to the Monod model. It incorporates the photo inhibition term. So it was proposed by the biochemist Haldane as also similar to the Monod model for an enzymatic reaction, where the substrate is also has an inhibitory effect and was later used by Iber as a phenomenological model. So similar to the Monod equation, at this level, there is no mechanistic understanding where this comes from. It is just a phenomenological model that happens to fit the data, and we will use it to describe the data. I will later show that you can have a mechanistic motivation for this model. People use it, so you have a kind of a differential equation that gives rise to this model. But for now, we will just use it as a phenomenological thing that describes the observed growth curves reasonably well. So like I said, this is very similar to the Mono model. The only difference is this term here that describes photo inhibition. So if you set this to zero, so this gamma parameter to zero here, this term vanishes and you are left with the usual mono term, mu star times i, km plus i. So depending on this, if it's zero, you have no photo inhibition. If it's a larger value, you will have photo inhibition. So we can look at how this looks in practice. So this is an example of this curve using a KM value. Uh, KM is the wrong word here, maybe a growth affinity of 280 about. So it's roughly here. You have this kind of dependency. This is under the assumption of no photo inhibition. Now, if you increase this parameter, you get the characteristic slope that includes the photo inhibition. It is smaller, a bit larger, and then even more, so it, it's depressed. And the data I will use happens to fit this reasonably well. So this is now data points for synecocystis, and I will use this as a kind of reference. So in the following, I will do everything using this growth curve as a reference. It's not so essential, so I could use different curves. They look quite generic. And if you look at different classes of cyanobacteria and also algae, you would find they all look pretty similar. And they're also in a similar range. So many have their growth maximum here in a few hundred micro Einstein, a few a bit lower. Very few have, have a higher, some, don't have the photo inhibition into very high light intensities, but usually the, the peak is in this range here, four to 600, some even lower. 
we have here these parameters. One thing to keep in mind is in this equation, this parameter up here, the mu star, is not the maximal growth rate. It's just a parameter in the equation. The maximal growth rate is actually this function here. And for this data, it's about 0 0.11. So here, about this. 0.11, whereas uh, this is just a parameter in the Mono model. So if this gamma here is zero, then this parameter and the maximal growth rate coincides. I will use this as a reference and I will introduce one more parameter which will become important. And this is the slope of this growth curve. So here at a very low light intensities, the curve starts rising. So this is obviously a light intensity versus growth rate, just like in the Mono curve, measured in the usual micromole photons per square meter per second. And you have here this slope, how does this growth curve look like? So this is not the time series, it's a static growth curve for different light intensities. Here you have the slope and the slope is defined as the derivative of the growth rate with respect to the light intensity at the light intensity zero or very small. And if you calculate it, you will find that the slope is given by the ratio between these two parameters, the new star divided by the cam. So this is what defines the slope here. Now we are ready to do some analysis. So to evaluate the productivity, we need to look at the photons absorbed per time by a cell. So a cell absorbs a certain number of photons per time, and we would like to know how many. And the absorbed photons per time are given by this photon flux here, I call it Ji, and the unit of this is photons per cell per time. And it is given as a product between, on the one hand, the light intensity, which is photons per square meter per time, as uh, usual for light intensity, and the extinction coefficient alpha, which is a square meter per cell. So if the cell was a black disk, the alpha would just be the actual surface area that the light hits, but cells are not black disks, so it's a kind of effective area that the photon has to hit to be absorbed. And if you multiply the two, you get the rate of photon absorbance per time. And it is slightly inconvenient to measure this per cell because cells have different sizes. So under different conditions, might have different volume, different areas. So I want to measure this with respect to gram dry weight. But the gram dry weight here is really meant to be the gram dry weight of a cell. So there's no culture there yet. There's no self shading. It's just one cell and the light intensity. I just measure it relative to gram dry weight, like here. So the whole thing is in the units photons per gram dry weight per time. This is absorbed. It doesn't say what it is used for. So it can be dissipated as heat. It can be absorbed somewhere in the cell that it has nothing to do with photosynthesis. But this is the, the rate of photons that is absorbed per time by the cell. First, we can look at what this value means for this data. And this is the data I will use as a reference throughout all the plots here. So it's a torpedo star measurement of semiconductor cystis 6803 from Tomas. And it's not essential here, the exact values, but to just have something that's a bit more realistic where you can relate the values to actual measurements. So we have this extension coefficient alpha here. And the extension coefficient is related first to the optical density of the wavelength at the wavelengths that is absorbed. So if we know the optical density and the culture density, we can calculate the alpha. It's not difficult to calculate. So here we have a 0.2 gram dry weight per liter. So this is a quite thin culture. OD was 0.63 at the 680 wavelengths. So this gives an alpha of about 0.7 square meter per gram dry weight. This is well within the range in the literature. So other people report values which are about one. So Jeff Huisman, who did the model of the light limited chemostat, one of the influential models says they are typically like one. I've seen other values which are 0 0.2, 0 0.5. So it's in this range and the measurements here are pretty much in the middle. Of course, the alpha usually depends on the OD, but it will also depend on the cellular state of the cell. We will discuss this later. Uh, for now, I will treat alpha as a constant. I will see in this particular experiment, in this growth setting, the alpha will have one value. It also relates to the pigments in the cell. So if it has more pigments, it will absorb more light. So alpha changes. It's not a fundamental constant of a strain. It, it will depend on the state of the cell also. Second simplification I will make in the following, I will always assume there is a single wavelength. 
So this is also how these experiments were done. We used monochromatic red light. It all makes the calculations a lot easier because you have kind of one wavelength, one photon. There's nothing very difficult now having a full spectrum. In this case, you of course have the coefficient alpha, not the single coefficient, but it would depend on the frequency or wavelength of the photons. So you have a whole spectrum. You have to have the absorbance of a whole spectrum. You have to sum it up, but in principle, nothing changes. So I, I will keep it as if all photons had a single wavelength. If you do this, now we can look at the photosynthetic yield. And the photosynthetic yield is defined as growth rate relative to rate of photon usage. So this is the ratio between the growth rate and the rate of photon absorbance. I should not usage in the sense that it is gone. I don't know what it is used for. It might be dissipated as heat, but the ratio of these two rates, photon uptake versus growth rate is defined as the yield. We can put this in, and if we have this, we can look at what units we have. Growth rate is measured per time, like per hour. Alpha is this extinction coefficient, is a square meter per gram dry weight, but here it's inverse, so it is gram dry weight per square meter. Same for the light intensity, mole photons per square meter per time, but here inverse, so we have to put it the other way around. And if you multiply all these, we see time cancels, square meter cancels. What we have is gram dry weight per mole photons. As it should be, this is a yield. So it's how much dry weight do we get per mole photon? We can now look at what is the value. If we use our growth rate, which fits the data reasonably well, it is this. So this is again, the same equation, it's the yield growth rate divided by the photon uptake. And you have this equation here, looks intimidating at first, but we see it consists of several parts. And we can focus first on this part here. This is an efficiency, or I call an efficiency. It's a factor that is between zero and one. So if the light intensity is zero, this term is zero, this term is zero, it's only these two ones here. So the value is one. And as the light intensity increases, this term will get smaller and smaller. So this is a function which I've drawn here, starts at one, and then with increasing light intensity will decrease until it hits zero. So this is a monotonically decreasing function that decreases with the light intensity. And I call this eta independence of the light intensity. Other part here, so this prefactor here, is the maximal yield. So since this can take maximally a value of one, the maximal yield that you can get out of the whole thing here is this guy here. And this is one over alpha mu star divided by the Km. And we already know this. We saw this ratio is nothing but the slope. So the slope was defined as the um, derivative of the growth rate to the light intensity, mu star to Km. So the maximal yield is actually the slope divided by the alpha. One of my points will be that these are actually quantities you can measure. Now we can look at this. So first, the yield of phototrophic growth is given by the maximal yield, which is the slope divided by the alpha, but there is a maximal yield, multiplied with efficiency. This is the eta, which is a factor between zero and one. So it can be the maximal value or it can be lower. If we plot it, we have here the growth rate with the experimental dots on it. And here we have the yield using the alpha that we estimated from the culture. And we see that for our data here, we get a maximal yield of about 0.3 gram dry weights per mole photon. So you have this monotonically decreasing function. There are several things to discuss here. In a minute, we will discuss whether this value is good or bad. For now, I want to just focus on the curves here. There are actually two groups in the literature, namely people who focus very much on the high growth rate. So the productivity solution sits up here at the high growth rate. And there's also a group who thinks it sits up here where the yield is maximum. This is the antenna truncation. I will come to this. First, if we look at this plot, we see that the high growth rates have low yields. And this is what I already said. This is quite a universal fact of life. I mean, everybody is like this. So whenever a resource is abundant, people start becoming sloppy with it. So the resource efficiency, use of resource becomes more efficient if the resource is not abundant, if it is scarce, if it's here. I mean, humans are like this. We use electricity, water, whatever. If it's cheap and abundant, we waste it. And if it's expensive and scarce, we are far more efficient with it holds for almost all microbes. So if you look at yeast or E. coli, if glucose is abundant, they often typically also have a very wasteful metabolism. Resource efficiency of glucose for growth is low. If glucose is scarce, they can switch and use a high yield mode of metabolism. 
So you have this kind of trade-off here, and this is now also a big topic in the microbial modeling community because evolution tends to favor rate. So if you're in competition in an environment with a lot of resources, rate is what you have to deliver. You have to outgrow the others. So you would not care about yield, you care about rate. If you are in different environments that are with scarce resources, you are not immediately overgrown, but resources are scarce, you would go to a high yield mode where, where you really make sure that the resources you have are used in the most efficient way. So this is almost a universal fact of life. Of course, later we can discuss what happens if the maximum growth rate is a bit higher. What would this mean? So shouldn't we have strains that have a maximum growth rate? And this is correct, but still as a fact within the strain, you will always find that high growth rates have low yields. The other thing, what about here? Here we have, can we go to a regime where we have a high yield per photon? And because this is an evolutionary choice of the organism, it can have a high yield, it obviously has at this point. So why can't we engineer the cell to have this high yield? And this is, at least in my understanding, what antenna truncation is about. This is suggested by Melis also quite a while ago. And the idea is we take away light from the cell, so we reduce the pigments, the harvesting of light, and make them think they're in the low light regime so that they have a high quantum yield. So the idea is if usual cell that maximizes rate that wants to compete has a lot of pigments, so they absorb a lot of light and evolutionary, it's favorable if you have like 100 photons more and grow just 1% better, it's, it's good to have these photons, no matter what the other cells can do with it. But a different cell at lower light might use these 100 photons much more efficiently. So here you have the high growth rate, but low efficiency. If you reduce the pigments, the idea is that you have more cells absorbing less light. Each, each of them has a higher quantum yield, a lower growth rate individually, but still a much higher efficiency relative to the photon usage. So the overall culture will become more productive. That's, I hope, a fair description of the antenna and truncation idea. And as far as I understand, the experimental evidence is shaky. So there are people who say it worked. There are people who say no. And I actually did a model and, and tried to basically show this. And it turned out to be a slightly different than I expected. So there is one flaw in this reasoning. And at the end, I will tell you what this flaw is. And we can discuss whether it's obvious or whether it's a misrepresentation of the antenna truncation idea. Anyway, so that's the, the low light setting. We can now back to the value. First question would be, is this a high or low value? So should we be happy or should we say, no, we have to choose different cultivation setup here. In lectures, I always do these polls, but this is too complicated in the Zoom meeting here. I would have to predefine it, but everybody of you can think, do you think this is a high value? So that this is pretty good. Do you think it is okay-ish? Should be a bit higher. Do you think this is low? It should be higher. And would you think this should be higher than one? Should it be higher than five? Or should it be higher than 10 or even higher? To find out, we can look at some analysis or models. And the first one is to look at overall oxygenic photosynthesis, just as it comes from Wikipedia. And you have this kind of overall equation, and you will see that there's a stoichiometric one-to-one -one relationship between oxygen and carbon. So if you have a linear electron transport, you release one oxygen, and with the outcome in ATP and NADPH, you are exactly able to fix one CO2. And to run to the electron, linear electron transport, you minimally need eight photons per O2. So you have in the photosystem two, to have one cycle of water splitting, you need four photons, you release the oxygen, but then you have four electrons in the system. And to get them through the linear electron transport, you have another four photons in photosystem one that you go on the second leg of the set scheme up so that you have a total of eight photons per O2 released. If you have eight photons per O2 released and there's a one-to-one -one stoichiometry with carbon, we can look at our maximal yield. So we get one mole CO2 or carbon for eight mole photons, one to eight. And C, so I'm looking just at the C, not at the other. The C has a molar mass of pretty much 12. So you need eight mole photons to get 12 carbon gram, only weighting the carbon. And carbon is about half of the biomass. So I typically sample half of the biomass is carbon. So it would be about 24 gram dry weight per eight mole photons. And this means you have a value of about three gram dry weight per mole photons. So that is an upper bound a bit. I mean, we are quite a bit lower, but of course it's not a super good estimate because um, we now have just the naked hydrocarbon here. 
we have no nitrogen, we have no other processes which also need energy, and for this energy we also need photons. So we must expect the actual value to be below three. So the question is, can we give a better estimate? One was given by Peart here in 1986 for growth on nitrate, and he wrote down this overall equation where you have a certain amount, 0.71 CO2, gives you 0.71 cmol biomass plus one oxygen. And if you again assume eight photons per oxygen molecule released, we get a ratio of about 2.1 gram dry weight per mole photon. An even better estimate is if you use the genome scan model. So th this, you really follow stoichiometrically the way of all molecules. So you start with the photons and you have the linear electron transport, you produce all the compounds. And if you do this in the genome scan model, you get a value of about 1.8 gram dry weight per mole photons. Purely stoichiometric, there is no dissipation as heat yet or anything else related to the, or the photon is absorbed somewhere else. It's really the, the optimal conversion you can get stoichiometrically going from photon to biomass. Mass. This is not a characteristic of the cell in itself. It will depend on the biomass composition and the nutrients, like I had in this previous one, the growth on nitrate. If you would grow on atmospheric nitrogen, for example, you would need more electrons, so you would have a lower ratio. If you grow on ammonia, it would be slightly higher. Also here, it depends on the biomass composition. If you have a lot of glycogen, you are you're closer to the hydrocarbon. You have a bit higher ratio. If you have lots of reduced compounds, you need a bit more. Anyway, 1.8 is what you get from this. I would claim that anything higher in the literature than this, you should get very suspicious. And I have seen a lot higher values reported. So this is the bit the reference. Uh, many values from the literature about one. So the, the range you, you see in like the Tulung Pakis paper would be about one gram dry weight per mole photons. So this is a kind of reference that you should get. And as we see, so it's quite a bit higher than the one we have. And I have to think about why this is the case. I don't know it. So just to, to summarize until here, we have used the Hardin model. The photosynthetic yield is the growth rate times the photon uptake. You can write this as the maximal yield times the efficiency of use. And so the maximal yield is the slope of the growth curve divided by the extinction coefficient alpha. Upper limit is three. That's really a hard limit. I would say anything higher than two is surprising. Typical values should be in the range of one. So that's the, the first part. And the important thing is here, we have values for the, I mean, we can look at this, we can measure them and we can interpret them. And these would be the important values to look at. So these are the values that are relevant for screening, if you want to screen. So it's not only the growth rate, best would be to know all these values. And in general, high growth rates still correspond to low efficiencies. For a single strain, that doesn't mean high growth rate of the organism isn't something good. So we can also give an intuitive interpretation of the growth rate. So this is the growth rate, again, same equation than before. We can rearrange it a bit. This is the same equation. There's nothing changed. I just wrote it differently. And if I write it like this, I can again split it up into factors. I have again here my maximal yield. I have here my efficiency and I have here my photon uptake rate. This also would hold for any other function. So I don't have to stick with the Haldane model. I can use any other model that would work the same way. In this way, I can write my growth rate as a product of three factors. I have the photon uptake rate, uh, so moles per gram dry weight that I take up. I have the efficiency between zero and one, and I have the, the maximal yield at which I can convert photons. So it is a gram dry weight per photons. So if I have the mole photons per gram dry weight per hour, and I have the gram dry weight per mole photons, and this dimensionless parameter, I get the total of the growth rate. So one over time, one over hour. And in this way, I see that the high growth rate in itself is not sufficient. If I get a strain with high growth rate because I increase this parameter here by increasing the alpha, I gain nothing. I won't solve any productivity problem because it might even be that I double this value and reduce a bit the efficiency. I have a higher growth rate still if I increase this more than I decrease this, but this higher growth rate won't give any additional productivity. I have a higher growth rate, but I actually have a lower efficiency. On the other hand, if I increase the growth rate by increasing this one, that's good. If I increase the growth rate by increasing this one, that's also good. So the one single message for all those who have to leave early would be by disentangling this, that in the measurements that we try to figure out what the relationship is and how do fast growing strains basically achieve their faster growth rate. 
Is it here, here, or here? My guess would be that this is pretty constant. It's very hard to increase the biomass efficiency. This is the most likely thing. If it is here, then they don't gain any productivity. That's the same productivity. I mean, you even decrease the productivity because you are very likely decreasing the mu when you increase this guy here. So the one message, if I, if I would have to boil it all to a single message, it would be, we have to disentangle this and we have to screen for these parameters. Just reporting the maximum growth rate is not sufficient. This doesn't tell anything. We, we have to know what happens in these parameters. So as yet, we had looked at an isolated cell without the gradient, without self-shading, without anything that makes a culture. So it's just the efficiency of the single cell that grows with a rain. And now the next step, if you want to increase productivity, you have to look at the culture. So you will typically have a kind of light gradient here. So this green box is my culture. There's light coming from above. It's more illuminated here than down here. And I will describe the light gradient using lambert bayer law. The vast majority of photobioreactor models use the lambert bayer relationship to describe the exponential attenuation of the light intensity. There are better models available. So the lambert bayer neglects a lot of things. That happens, for example, backscattering and things like this are not captured in the lambert bayer My claim would be, if you want a qualitative understanding of what goes on, you don't need this. I mean, you can make better models and you can put a lot of time into making better models that Lambert Bayer, it won't give you any qualitative understanding. Lambert Bayer is sufficient, so I will use it. And there are two ways to now solve this culture. And these are growth integration, light integration. I borrow this terminology from Shevedi and Poston in a, from a paper, but the approach is universal. By far the dominant way to look at it is growth integration. So most people who solve photobioreactor models would do growth integration. Very few do light integration. Light integration is often considered to be a kind of rough approximation. What I want to convince you is that this is actually biologically two completely different regimes. And in an actual setting, you might be either closer to this one or you might be closer to this one, depending on the specific how specifics how you set up the photobioreactor. So how does it work? Modeling according to growth integration. The idea is that each cell grows locally according to the local light intensity. So the cell moves here. We assume a homogeneous culture. It's well mixed, meaning that the density of cells is always the same. It's not denser here. So it's not a lake where cells maybe sink to the bottom. It's shake. I mean, there's mixing. It's the same density throughout. There's light attenuation like this one. And the cell moves around. What I've shown here is the growth rate as a function of the depths using a light intensity of 1,200 micro Einstein and the cell density of 0.2 gram per liter, which is the one we used in the eLife paper. So this is similar to this. Cell moves up and down, well mixed, and at each point it will see the growth rate that it has. So here it will grow with this growth rate, it will here it will grow with this growth rate, here it will grow with this growth rate. And to get the average growth rate, you have to sum them all up or integrate them, and then you get the average growth rate of the culture. This is how growth integration works. And the nice thing, it can be solved analytically. So you can actually, even for the Haldane one, integrate this analytically. You get an equation, and it's an ugly equation, but you can get it. Before this was 0.2 gram per liter, this would be the growth rate as a function of 2 gram per liter. So still not very high. You see that there's a small range where growth actually happens. So the cell moves around, and here it grows at this, and here nothing happens. And this points a bit to the problem in the growth integration, that there is a huge area where no growth happens, and only a very small area where growth actually happens. So light integration is the idea that cell absorb according to its path, the light, but they have a certain buffering capacity. So they don't grow here at this rate and here at this rate but they grow according to an average rate that depends on how much light they have seen in the past period. And if you have it very strictly, the cell grows according to the average light intensity. In the culture, you can calculate this. And the, the nice thing about the average light intensity is that you can immediately measure it if you know the light here and the light that goes out, you can calculate the average light intensity. So it's something that's very easy to measure. And that's what sets the, the growth rate of the cell. So you can make this a bit more formal. There is, like I said, the Halding growth equation can be derived from a mechanistic model that was proposed to Eilers and Peters, end of 70s, late 70s, early 80s, later also Han. And uh, it looks like this. You have a photosystem, which is representative for the entire 
photosynthetic apparatus, so electron transport chain, photosystem one and two. It's activated by light, absorbs a photon, it gets activated, and then the reverse relaxation to the basal state. This is what defines growth. So this is the energy you harvest for growth. And if you have the activated state, it can get activated again by absorbing a photon, and this is photo damage. And this then results in repair, which is slower than these processes. And if you solve this, you will get the Haldane equation. So you can write down the elementary equation of these reactions. You solve it and you get the Haldane equation. And this is widely used also as a kind of minimal model of photosynthesis. And the difference between growth and light integration is now how do these processes behave relative to the light changes that you see while moving inside the photobioreactor? If the light changes much slower than any of these processes, these are at steady state relative to the light. So you first solve this and then you change the light. This is growth integration. If the light changes faster than these processes, then you have to do it the other way around. You have first integrate over the light and afterwards you solve these equations you get two different results. My point is both of them are idealized solutions. The one is the light is infinitely fast compared to the processes, that's light integration, or the light, so the, the mixing is infinitely slow compared to the internal processes. Depending where you are, you get the one or the other solution. There's a minor twist for the light integration. The way these equations look like mean that you see here it's the light and it always is individually. It's just I, 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 I here four times. If you integrate this in light integration, you get that the function of the average is the average of the function, or the average of the function is the function of the average. That's a very unique behavior, and this model has it. You could do this kind of light growth with any equation. It just happens that for these particular equations, it even gets simpler if you do the light integration because it is really average light intensity that matters. We don't need to look at this in detail. I want to say it because this linear behavior has been measured. So people have been actually measuring some of the rates and dependence of the light intensity and indeed found they were linear. So it's not just me talking stuff here. We have actually, not me personally, but the scientific community has measured some of these rates and then actually they have these kind of forms. We can do these two solutions, and the argument is that in any real setting, you are in between. So the real culture is in between light and growth integration, and basically it depends how fast you mix. Both are like idealized solutions. If you mix very, very fast, you are closer to light integration. You means it's, you mix faster than internal processes. This is only possible in a thin layer culture. Nothing in the theory says you should use a thin layer, but of course, if you want to mix fast, you need a thin layer because if you have a two meter photobioreactor, you won't mix it fast. It's just not possible. If you have a three millimeter layer, you can mix it very fast because three millimeter is not a lot. Even with the thin layer, you can only do it approximately. Any real culture I would claim is in between. So we have these two extreme values, what we should expect from the culture, and the claim is that fast mixing gets you to the light integration. So final step, productivity of a culture. What is it? It is the product of the density times the growth rate. So the volumetric productivity is defined density times growth rate, culture density, units, drum dry rate per volume, growth rate defined as one over time. So the whole thing has drum dry rate per volume per time. This is what we want. We want productivity, but we don't want volumetric productivity because our light intensity is measured in mole photons per square meter per time. So the light intensity is limited per area. So you have a certain area, the area has the, time, the light and that's limiting. So we look at the aerial productivity relative to the light intensity. And you get the aerial by just multiplying by the depths of the reactor. So it's rho, so the culture density times, times depths. And this is gram driver per area per time. This is what we will be looking at. And again, you will see there is a sort of trade-off here, usually fast growing strains and also the fast growing strains that the fast growth rates we know from the literature are usually in, in thin cultures. So this is very low, this is high, it means you have a low productivity because, so you have two antagonistic things. Usually as the density gets higher, which is good because we want a high density, the growth rate gets lower and vice versa. So you have to find a kind of sweet spot in between. So this is what is shown here. So the curves you will look at, I want to evaluate the productivity with the parameters light and culture density, or this one. 
And you can assume it, it's like a torpedo start. I have a torpedo start, I can tune in my O and I can tune in a certain light intensity. In this case, I keep the light intensity fixed and in the torpedo start, I change the dilution. So I change my O, my density and see what is the productivity of the whole thing. And this is what is shown here. You have this kind of curve and the orange uh, yellowish curve is the growth rate. And you will see, so here's the culture density and this is the area productivity. And like I said, like in a torpedo start, you fix the culture density. You have a fixed light intensity of 1,200 micro Einstein here. And we get this kind of productivity. If you choose a different culture density, you get this value. And what you see here, there's a broad range where you have a fairly high productivity, but all of these occur at places where the growth rate is already quite low. And this is exactly the trade-off between growth rate and culture density. Now, I want to step through a few light intensities here. When we have a low light intensities, 200 micro Einstein. These are the difference between uh, growth integration, the blue curve, and pink here, violet, the light integration. Like I said, it depends on the mixing. I, I would claim you are somewhere in between here. If you have a thin layer culture, fast mixing, you're at the upper end. If you have like a slow mixing, a conventional big volume reactor, you're at the lower end here. And depending on how fast you mix, you're somewhere here. You will see the difference is not that big. I mean, you have before, I mean, it's questionable whether you can actually resolve this in an experiment. You have a decrease with culture density. What I didn't tell you, I assume a small maintenance energy that is needed. And that for high density brings down the productivity because of respiration. So you have these kind of slopes here. This is for low light intensity. So what happens if you increase the light intensity? So but based on these values, I mean, there wouldn't be much difference you can get. And especially for low densities, these curves are almost identical. So for low densities, you can forget about the difference. doesn't matter. It's all the same productivity anyway. If you increase light intensity, factor three, so from 200 to 600, and I will also scale a plot from five to 15 here. You are now at 15, 600 here, and you see the difference gets much larger. You now have a broad plateau here with the culture density, and this is expected because it means that all the light is basically absorbed in the culture. At some point, if you increase the culture density, all light is absorbed. And from this on, you will have the same productivity because you don't absorb any more light. It's all is absorbed, so you will flatten out. But there is the maintenance term. So if you still increase the density, you will decrease your efficiency because you add basically more dead volume. You add more culture that has no light but still has to do respiration. Again, for low culture densities, there's no difference in both descriptions, but for higher densities, it gets larger. Now we can increase the light even more. Instead, before we had the, the 205, now I make a factor 10 to 2050. So I'm here now at 50, here I'm 2000. You see there's a big difference and the growth integration almost does not increase anymore. So you cannot increase the culture productivity by higher light intensity, so how higher density is using the assumption of growth integration. But in light integration, you do. So it keeps on. So now you would have optimal densities in a range of 6 to 12. And if you just, for the fun of it, go to 8,000, the difference gets larger and larger. So you know you're 8,000 micro Einstein, you have a peak here. It still continues rising, about 170 gram drive per day whereas this one is stuck at the bottom. And by the way, you can always look at the yield by dividing the light intensity. So you have the light intensity versus the productivity. And uh, you, you see that for these values, you get values close to 0.3, which is our maximal yield. So this is here the value for the peak. For this here, the maximal productivity, they maintain these high yields also in the culture. The bottom line here is that light and growth integration give drastically different results. Growth integration, we see no increase of productivity for high light intensities. Light integration, we see overall higher productivities and they increase with increasing light intensity and density. So this is a prediction of the test. I can first look at it in context. I can vary both of it, density and light intensity. Light integration, fast mixing, thin layer, you would expect this kind of dependence. So it's almost linear with the light intensity. So here's the light intensity. This is the productivity. Productivity increases with light intensity. It's pretty flat with respect to culture density, which means that after a certain density, you basically absorb all light. And afterwards, you just add density. You don't absorb more light because everything is absorbed already. If you look at the view from growth integration, so slow mixing, you see no increase with increasing light intensity. 
you have a low aerial productivity. There is also flat culture, respect to culture density, but overall there is no increase with the light intensity. So the, the crucial difference is how do cultures increase their productivity with light intensity? And like I said, I don't have the full experimental things, but we can look at some experimental data to see if at least it's possible to maintain it. So the, the prediction would be if we can realize the light integration, then we would see an increase of productivity linear with light intensity to arbitrarily high light intensities, basically. We don't see any photo inhibition. I mean, we had photo inhibition in the model, but it doesn't matter. And the results can be realized by thin layers according to the model. So I can look at this paper. They collected a lot of bioreactor data, uh, productivities versus light intensity, and plotted them. So it's a big table. It's about 100 studies or so. And it looks like this. You see that if you believe these literature values, some you should not believe. So this is obviously a joke here. You see that there is a dependence. So obviously with high light intensity, people achieve also high productivities. And just to give a reference, this dotted line here is about one. This is the yield of one gram dry weight per mole photons. So they are almost all at this range here. This is our values. Like I said, our simulated values extrapolating from the small culture. We are here, we are below, we have to look into why this is the case. But what this, in my opinion, proves is that you can actually realize this. I mean, all these are different strains. They are uh, chlorella, spirulina, semicrococcus, all kinds of strains, but all of them, the, the individual growth rates all look pretty much the same. This is spirulina here from Richmond. Based on this, I think you can realize this regime and cultures obviously function at high light intensities and they are still productive and they keep the productivity that you see in smaller volumes. So this is basically what, what opens up to produce algae at a larger scale. And the claim would be that you can use this using the thin layer cultures. So these are the take-home messages. Screening should document meaningful parameters, not growth rate as such. If you have these uh, slow extinction coefficients yields, with them you can extrapolate to the culture level and the high yield is maintained, even or in particular in dense cultures and high light intensities. Now, that's the main message. I want to now briefly step through one last thing, namely the alpha was constant until now. So the extinction coefficient, depending on the pigments. And in these models, it's always constant. So in these models, we cannot switch the alpha because, of course, it would be much nicer if we just decrease the alpha. We have a much higher yield, but we don't know how this affects the growth rate because in the model, they are independent. I can just declare it has a higher growth rate. So to understand this better, so this is a reminder. Alpha actually depends on the acclimation state of the cell. So we, we did the resource allocation models like in 2019 by Marjan Faisi and looked at not the overall growth equation, but allowing the cells to vary their internal composition. And in this also vary the pigment content and the absorption. And I don't want to go through any detail. So this is the cell reactor. It now has far more internal processes. It can allocate resources internally. And most results are fairly similar, but you have the, the chemostat, you have the productivity as a function of the dilution rate. It looks quite similar. You have again the effect that the high productivity is obtained at low growth rates. And what you can do, what you cannot do in the phenomenological model, you can now vary the pigment allocation and vary not just independently by magic, but having really the cell decide what kind of pigments are optimal and use the resources to synthesize the pigments. So decreasing the growth rate if they have more pigments. And in particular, you can distinguish between the strategies of the cell itself, namely maximizing its own growth rate, what the wild type would do. So the assumption is the wild type optimizes its own growth rate. If it wants to grow as fast as it can in a competitive environment versus cultural productivity like the socialist cell. It wants not to maximize its own growth rate, it wants to maximize the whole productivity of the culture. And we can look through the protein and pigment allocation change between these two scenarios. And so we can look at the wild type strategy, maximum growth rate. We see there is a lot investment into light harvesting. I wouldn't take the absolute value so serious. It's just like there is a lot of investment into light harvesting. And we now can compare this to cultural productivity optimized cells, so socialist cells that don't maximize their growth rate, but they want to contribute to the cultural productivity. And what we see is a massive reduction in light harvesting. In turn, the, the culture as a whole gets much denser. So this is exactly the antenna truncation thing. 
you truncate antenna, individual cell is more efficient, you have more cells with the same light intensity, so you have an overall improvement of the cultural productivity. Drawback here is the overall productivity improvements are low. This is the mutant, this is a computational optimization, so if it's a little bit better, it will completely switch the proteome, but in reality, there's almost no improvement in productivity question is, why is that? And that is what I promised the flaw in the antenna truncation mutant. The whole idea of the antenna truncation is that the electron transport chain operates at low saturation. So you must have an electron transport chain that is far from saturation to have a high yield. The highest yield state you could possibly have is you have a cell in darkness and then a single photon hits. That has basically everything free. The more photons hit, the less the efficiency become because that photosystem has to process them. They might not be used. They might be already have absorbed in photon. So the idea rests on the assumption that you operate the electron transport chain and, and the whole photosynthetic electron transport far below saturation. That's where you have the high yield. That's true. And the problem is someone has to synthesize also the electron transport chain. So they are synthesized from resources that the cell itself has to provide. So it's like if you have a truck and your truck has a better fuel efficiency, if you just have one kilo load instead of a ton. So you could have just one kilo and you have a better fuel efficiency per kilo than if you have a lot of load. And so you can do this. The problem is to transport the same amount of weight now to place B you have to have like 100 trucks, each with one kilo. You still have a better fuel efficiency per kilogram. The problem is someone has to buy the trucks also, and you have to maintain the trucks and repair them and they get stolen. So the problem with the antenna truncation, in my opinion, is you have to pay for the excess capacity in the electron transport chain. So you have a massive capacity, but you get only the high yield if you don't use it. Then you have the yield, but your cost that you maintain the capacity is exactly as much as if you would just jam it and say we, we saturate it. This is why the advantage cancels out. And in my opinion, this also means this explains a bit why the experimental evidence is so shaky, because these are two quantitative effects. They depend on how fast the repair is, how do you build it. So this might differ on situation to situation. This is not like a yes or no thing. It's something quantitative. So two effects that are equal, but in one situation, one might be larger than the other, so that you see a kind of whatever happens. So it can have a positive effect, but it isn't guaranteed. And I think from what I know in the literature, people don't discuss the cost of the antenna truncation. They just look at the increase in yield, but that is just one side of the equation. The other, you have to synthesize the stuff. That's now the absolute end. You will be relieved to hear. Take home messages are, in my opinion, and this was, like I said, a bit more like a lecture than a talk, I think we have a lot to do on informed screening of quantitative parameters. So if there's one thing to remember, I think the growth rate, you can disentangle into contributions, yield, efficiency, and light uptake. If you want to screen, don't just say the maximum growth rate is higher. Try to disentangle what happens, and then we can go on and really find strains and find out what are the trade-offs, what controls these parameters. I think second high phototrophic productivities are possible using appropriate cultivation setups. So we can scale this up and we must scale this up. And all the data I've seen suggests that this is also possible without using these very complicated reactor setups. With this, I want to thank the people involved, in particular, Thomas who did the experiments. Uh, I used Marjan did the chemostat experiment. And with this, I think 